Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Man and Machine Podcast Extreme. And previously, a couple of episodes ago, we had the great Alton Takeyasu as a guest. And now we have another, let's call him guest, but we can also call him um, friend or uh, you know future uh, contributing member. Uh, he is Nick from the Centurions Facebook group. He's one of the admins. Uh, hey, Nick, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for the invite, guys. I appreciate being asked to come on the show. And hello to everybody else. Okay, uh, we're, I'm doing okay, Nick. And yeah, thank you for being here because Centurions fandom owes you a massive debt for setting up the group. Uh, I'm just glad that we're able to unite so many collectors and one you know Centurion collectors in one area so i'm grateful for all the members that joined absolutely and and, and we're we're growing in a constant pace uh my other uh friend here in the show is mark uh hey mark how's it going oh, i'm doing okay hope everyone else is doing okay too absolutely and uh, my name is yuri as always uh for today we picked a kind of a you know uh uh um coffee table chat or a fireside chat type of topic because uh this is something that we usually discuss you know in on facebook or in the in in group discussions but i think it really relates to a lot of fans who are either collectors want to be collectors or or just have rediscovered centurions and it is the topic of actually you know buying the toys collecting the toys um just for future notice we'll you know because the fandom is kind of split between people who only collect toys people who don't want to buy the toys but are into the cartoons and you know and people who are both actually so uh this will be a mostly toy um oriented episode and we will also have episodes about the cartoon itself with episode reviews uh which we already tried once with the mark uh we'll see if it goes uh live before this episode or after this episode but since uh you know an episode is so long like just the episode is is half an hour long we had some uh trouble as always but especially in this case to keep keep it under one hour and it went a bit bit uh over time so so yeah today we're going to just talk uh toys and how to get the toys and how to to build a collection what are the pitfalls what to to pay attention to um and basically what platforms you can use to to get the toys but before we start that just because we did it with mark and and with me as well uh nick how's how's your collection and and what's your history as a as a collector mainly centurions but also you can mention like other things you collect uh i've been a toy collector for pretty much most of my life you know as a little you know growing up you know, we all kind of take that transition out of uh, getting out of toys and into video games. And I call it maturity, you know, dating and hanging out with friends. For me, I, you know, I moved on to video games, but I always eyeball toys and uh, was still buying them and just displaying them. So I never, re- I guess that back, even back then, I didn't realize I was a toy collector. But, I, you know, it kind of evolved to it over the years. Uh I've been actively, you know, purchasing toys, hunting toys down, going to toy shows since the 90s and till now. So I pretty much do anything that's 80s and early 90s related. I started off mainly as a G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, 82 to 94 collector. And from there, I just moved on to Transformers and Cheerions, Ghostbusters, and to almost any uh, I, I dabble on almost any toy line from the 80s cool so so for you is it toy lines that you remember or do you discover toy lines and 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 what was what was that specifically with centurions for me most of my collection focuses focuses on toys that i had as a child or i always wanted as a child mm-hmm. growing up i didn't have any centurion toys at all my parents were uh, they were a little frugal on buy- what they would buy for me and my brother. Uh, we were able to get a G.I. Joe figure here and there because at the price point at the time, they were $3 or $3.50. They weren't that much. While Centurion figure, 
Mark, you, uh, you probably remember better than I do. They were what, like ten dollars back in the day? Uh, yeah, they could be anywhere from nine to twelve dollars, depending on the store. Yeah, and uh, most of the time, I remember seeing the Centurions were in a drug mart. Uh, we, we, back then, we called it Refco for anyone that remembers that turned into CVS over here in, in the uh, United States. And they had a nice little toy aisle where I used to get my GI Joes. And I remember seeing Centurions, and I think Mark was right; they were going to be about twelve ninety nine at that location. And my parents definitely never bought me one. Uh, the kid down the one street over, my neighbor, or whatever, they he had one. And for him, he never he had Ace McCloud, and to him that was a really kind of a, just a dumb toy. And he still let me borrow it all the time. And man, I love that toy. Uh, I had you know I used to spend hours playing with it before I had to give it back to him, or you know you know you do your typical trade for a couple days, and then give him one of my toys, and I would have his his Ace McCloud. And then I, after the two after when I started kind of taking a break from GI Joe because I got pretty much what I wanted in that toy line. Centurions was definitely one of the first toy lines I went. Uh, I, I uh, you know, was starting to actively hunt down for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting that uh, Mark is a different type of collector. I'm a different type of collector, and you are also a different type of collector. Um, I know that Mark, uh, you know, as as a young adult, found these uh, these toys. Uh, me, you know, I, I grew up basically watch, I grew up on the reruns of the Centurions and some 80s shows. So f for me, it was like a, I would say, I would say secondhand experience in, in, in a way. And you, you, you know, you collect lines and stuff. So I know that, you, for example, you have the G.I. Joe flag, the big, you know, uh, aircraft carrier. And also you might have had the turtles, you know, the, um, the, the turtles uh, that base uh, set. So you have oh, some, the, uh, some really big and expensive uh, was it the sewer playset or the uh, Thunderdrome, was it called? Something drone? Technodrome. Okay, thanks. I got both. Uh, my Ninja Turtle collection was primarily of the first two years of that toy line because that's what I remember having as a child and playing with. Ninja Turtles was pretty much the last toy line that I played with as a kid before I discovered and moved on to Nintendo and all that. So I only kind of focused my Ninja Turtle collection mainly to the first two years of the toy run. But I did get a few items that I would have loved to have had if they would have made it earlier in the line. Like the Technodrome that came out, I think, by like the third or fourth year of that toy line. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I got kind of a little lost here on the topic here on that one. But, uh, no worries, no worries. So, so how does your uh, Centurions collection look like? Uh, I got the entire you, I, the the entire retail run of the collection. I was lucky um, over the year. I had Ace, and then I ended up picking up Max and Jake a couple months after I got Ace, and then I only had the three for a little while. And then a local toy shop that we had in our area. I knew one of the employees over there, and he kept telling me to come on down. They have a bunch of Centurion toys. So I went down to take a look at them, and this store had really tall ceilings, really tall. <laughs> and the Centurion figures were way on the top shelf. And, Mark, you know the store, big fun. Uh, how, like, the top shelf on that on the wall, what would you say? That was like 10 feet in the air or more? Probably. It's been a long time since I've been there, and uh, aren't they out of business now? Anyway, yeah, that, at least at they least as a down. brick and mortar store. Yeah, they closed down unfortunately over the years. But uh, yeah, they 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 had centurions all on the top shelf. They were like ten feet in the air, and no one really looked up that high. So they had to get a uh, eight foot ladder just to pull everything down, and they were like covered in dust. And I just looked at, it and there it was pretty much the entire collection all boxed and complete and i'm like boxed and complete but not mint right nah pretty close to it they're not all mint but you know a little worn out but you know a little usage here and there and the boxes were yeah mckenner didn't use the best quality cardboard on those boxes so you know they had your typical shelf wear and mm -hmm. I, I just looked at the whole collection and i'm just like how much you want for the whole lot and i just i just bought everything i i, I just bought everything all at once so you had one of each from that, or did they uh, have? There were a couple people? doubles in there. I had uh, like I had a Def Charger, and then there I had a sealed Def Charger that came in that lot. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to remember, 
I think there was an extra, I had an extra detonator in that lot that I ended up turning around and selling the Def Charger an extra detonator uh, to someone locally. But yeah, I got everything in there. Traumatizer, C-Bat, Slingshot, uh, everything was in there. And then I even picked up enough extra figures to display in the weapon systems all at once. Sweet. Wow. Wow. So, so guys, uh, we know the story of like how the toys were sold. You know, there were some um, general retail ones in the 80s, you know, specifically 80, 86, of course. And there was, there was, for example, the Traumatizer that was a, um, a store exclusive for Sears. Um, so we know how they were sold when they were originally released. For both of you guys, maybe, you know, Mark, Mark chime in uh, first. Um, what was your experience uh in the 90s did you see these toys pop up on you know maybe garage sales or in collectors you know clubs how did you see these guys these these figures you know being sold or or, or shown off well i i didn't go to the collector's places that much during that era um here's how i got my centuries toys um i i was around when the the toy line was new because i'm old but i never bought it when it was new um yeah, it took me a while to got, get into Centurions. You know, as I've said before, the way I knew about the series was that my uh, uh, Hollywood friend, Mark Scott Zickley, told me that this was this forthcoming cartoon he was writing about, about three guys fighting evil. So I started watching it to, to specifically see his episodes, and I started getting into the show and um, the toys. And by the time I started buying them, they were on clearance. I remember going into... Uh, the local Toys R Us, and um, seeing that they had, oh, uh, get ready to be blown away by this. They had detonator for a dollar ninety nine, and I actually had asked the clerk just to make sure you're really selling this big thing for a buck ninety nine. Yes, sir, we are. Yeah, so I started buying them. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, back in those days we had uh, Toys R Us, uh, Kitty City, and Ch Children's Palace in the Cleveland area. We also had like. Well, we didn't have Walmart or Target yet in Cleveland, but we had Kmart. We had a place called Gold Circle, uh, uh, another place called Best Product. Um, I don't remember seeing them at Revco, but then I never really looked there, and now I wish I had. Uh, but, yeah, so, um, and, of course, Sears. That's where I got my traumatizer, finally. I think that might be where I got my hacker, too, because, um, yeah, I remember that the toys were... Um, very widely available in the clearance aisles, except for, um, you know, the uh, three uh, hard-to-find things, Seabat, Swingshot, and Traumatizer, and Hacker was harder to find than the other figures for some reason, but I did get one eventually. In fact, Nick and I have talked about this. Um, I had some financial reversals, and I had to sell pretty much my whole uh, collection, and I sold them the big fun, and some of the toys uh, Nick has now may well have been mine. How interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that is definitely, there is pretty good odds that a couple of the figures or at least half pie at one point were Mark's that I went in and purchased after he sold them. So yeah. are you planning on giving them back to Mark? Nope. <laughs> They're mine now, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> wow. So, you know, fragile friendships break apart so easily. <laughs> over uh, these. Uh, There's so, a new poll, though. That, that, I had them before the friendship, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, you know, that, that's, that. fine. that's fine, Nick. You don't have to give them back to me. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, I have a home invasion to plan. What's that, Mark? <laughs> never mind, you never know mind. That Nick is an armed civilian. Mark, do you know that Nick, Nick is an armed civilian? Uh, never mind. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying there's more than, you know, when it comes to detonators, it's not just an exo frame or a weapon system for Nick. It's much more than that. No, Mark, what you're saying, it's kind of funny because my childhood friend has uh, my, my childhood Ninja Turtles. I sold it to him back in the 90s to raise money to buy my first Nintendo. You know, it's what that was... 40 years later, 35 years later, whatever it is now, and uh, I look at them, I'm like, dude, man, I want my Rocksteady and Bebop back. He's like, no, they're mine. 
yeah, but they're my childhood ones. He's like, yeah, and so they're mine because you sold them to me. I'm like, well, I'll buy you another Rocksteady and Bebop. I'll buy you Mint ones. Just give me those back. He's like, no, man, those are mine now. It's like, you know, those are the ones I had since the 90s. So you sold them, they're mine now. And I'm like, ugh. I keep bugging him about that. I, I Like, I've offered to, re, to buy him brand new, you know, make edition figures to just swap out. But, yeah, he, he won't go for it. Wow, wow. Well, I, yeah. I was talking to a friend today uh, about uh, some Transformers figures. And, uh, you know, uh, there are some parallel. Nick, you, you might be aware of. I don't know. Do you collect the, the recent editions, like the recent generations toys? Um, Earthrise, I am. I kind of suckered me back in the tra- uh, the modern Transformers. Yes. Oh, gotcha. This this was a bit before, like a few years ago, when the up until you know this these recent editions, you know Hasbro and Takara released separate uh, separate uh, editions of these toys, and Takara because for some reason Japanese collectors are willing to shell out more for their toys, had different paint jobs, more premium paint jobs, and my friend asked me like. Or, so if when you buy the premium ones that you want to buy, would you sell the U.S. retail versions to me? And I'm like, no, I have a principle. I do not ever under any circumstances sell toys. If if I buy something, I make the decision to buy it, to buy it for life. So, so you know, that that's how I avoid, you know, losing any toys. <laughs> uh, hopefully I don't have, I won't have a financial, you know, situation where i would have to get rid of them but you know if i buy something i'm like okay the, the only person who might sell this hopefully is is will be my my you know my children or or something but not me or or you know anything like that well i, I remember I, what you're talking about though because i do remember uh back when the generations line was coming out that the car ones were a lot nicer than the hasbro ones <laughs> and i did shell out some cash to get to the car ones because they uh, the hasbro ones were just not as nice uh, that's true and they had also some extra pieces but uh, uh sorry mark you were about to uh say something well first uh yuri i mean good luck not having to sell any anything uh and, and nick i'm serious Huh? And, and also, I, I just said thanks. Oh, thank you. Anyway, and Nick, well, it would be cool to have my original Centurions toys back. I mean, seriously, if if I ever got any money to start collecting these things again, I would settle for getting new ones as long as they were in good shape. Mark, if you yeah, you know, if you want the if if for any reason we're able to ID one, is definitely yours. Find me a suitable replacement, and you can have the original one back in your collection. That's the way I look at it. So, because I have no childhood connection to them, because I didn't have them as a child. I, uh, you know, they they were purchased as an adult, so I don't have that sentimental attachment to each one of them. If you follow me, well, I didn't that. start buying them until I was twenty four or so, but I still have kind of an attachment to them. But, yeah. but thank you so much, Nick. That's very generous of you. Yeah, it's all. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, I was just about to say that brings up kind of an interesting uh, what, what you said about how you make that commitment to sell and all that, and uh, uh, that's an that's an interesting way of looking at it. That really is uh, for me. It's uh, you know I, I bought toy lines and then had it for a few years and got kind of my enjoyment out of it, and then realized there's maybe perhaps something else I want more. So it's due to limited spacing, it's something's got to go. So. I, I've been known to sell off a collection to fund, you know, or sell off part of my collection to fund another, you know, that fund something new for it. Right, right. And uh, I, actually, since, you know, of course, you know, there's a hierarchy amongst gamers and, you know, they, they, they use this expression, the PC gaming master race, because, you know, PC gamers have this attitude that they were the original gamers and then come cons- console gamers. So as a PC gamer, I, ha- I I totally respect, you know, that you had a part of your life devoted to Nintendos and things like that. But since you probably, you know, played these ro- some of these adventure games or role-playing games, you know, so I, I guess they, are, they exist even on the consoles, not only on PCs. Uh, so I'm sure you're aware of these quests, you know, where, you know, just to, you know, proceed or progress with your, with your main quest, you have to do these errands for NPCs for, for like non-player characters. And so I, I think you're being too, too generous. This is a too low level quest for Mark to just find replacements for your figures. I think you should, you should say something like, well, if you get back my turtles from my friend that I had in my childhood, (laughs) Then you can get your centurions back that you had earlier on. I think that would be your your style of a quest. Uh, 
It's funny. Uh, it, it is funny, but I kind of know that it's going to be an impossible task with my with my particular friend on that one. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Mark will get more experience points, points, you know, and he will level up faster in the game. <laughs> Fine, then I'll plan another. But then again, that, that... I just gonna say I'll plan another home invasion <laughs> then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we'll we'll just call you home invasion, Mark. So yeah. <laughs> So, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was thinking of like doing these small skits, you know, or writing these uh, s uh, short, you know, um, inserts into our shows with like, you know, just fictional scenarios and stuff. And I was I was trying to conceive like what would be like our characters. And I, I, I see a pattern here of like, who has what kind of style and, and yeah, I totally see, see you like Mark impersonating Vic McLeod, who is not getting hired to the Centurions because he's like a petty criminal and he does home invasions and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, they, they design so, yeah. all this, they design all this fancy equipment for me and now I can't even use it. Yeah, and so someone someone puts up these weapons, like these actual combat weapon systems, on eBay in the in the near future, you know, and uh, and they're like, oh, who who's who, who hides under the username? Definitely not Vic McLeod. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, oh, so so Vic is um, is a, a crook and a dummy. Are you sure he's not hacker in disguise? You know, actually, we never really explored what Hacker's, you know, full name is or whether he's called Hacker and, you know, his, his family is called the Hackers or not. So, you know, he might actually be, you know, he, well, actually, you know what? He shares the blue with, with his supposed brother. So th this might be an interesting fan theory to explore, you know. You know, for a villain that goes by the name of Hacker, he doesn't really look like a guy that knows how to use a computer to me. <laughs> well, you know, probably he... <laughs> in in the history of you know uh, uh, cyberpunk or you know futuristic sci-fi series, he's probably the 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 least uh, capable hacker of all. You know, like if you put it on the scale of like on that one end of the scale, there's uh, what's it called, um, Mr. Robot, or what was that series recently? Yeah. Um, and on the on the other end, it's Hacker, and you know <laughs> they're both hackers, but in a different way. I mean, come on, the dude only has one hand. I mean, yeah, he's, you know, he's doing the best with his life. He has a really positive attitude to life. You know, he's he's making the most of it. You know, it's like it, it must be difficult to hack things, you know, with with one hand. So, you know, it's you know, kudos to him. It depends which sense of the word you're using. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> That's very true. Um, but anyways, returning to the topic. So, so, um, so, um, I know Mark, you said you didn't really get involved with collecting and these communities in the nineties. Um, Although, Nick, what, what did, did you, yep. Well, I mean, there was that time when I lucked into the Rex charger prototype, which I still have. I mean, uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know how much that counts as collecting so much as it counts as a lucky break. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you had that experience uh, that was kind of you know it, it was a it was a really great find, and you know we'll talk about the history of that. So not to spoil that for a you know for, spoil the fun of another episode. Um, and so, Nick, what was your experience collecting in the '90s or you know before the before the eBay boom? Um, did you see any Centurions figures or or what was just general collecting then? Centurions is something that I don't even recall seeing all that much back in the day. Uh, I remember going, you know, I would back in the early '90s, mid '90s, before the internet became what it is now, was eBay and then uh, online forums and message groups. Mm -hmm. You know, toy hunting was basically going to garage, flea markets, garage sales, and uh, comic book shows. Because at the time there really were no toy shows in my area that I that I know of. It was uh, comic book shows, and you would you know you would go and you occasionally find the uh, toy over there, or you go to comic book stores and some stores would start carrying. They would have a case, uh, display case with some used toys in there that people would sell. And Centurions was something I don't re really recall seeing at all 
and any like at flea markets or anything like that. It was like it, it was like I don't know how to describe it. It was this weird. It, it was like a toy line that you just after it was originally released, you never saw it again, and wow. anywhere. And even now, when I go to a toy show, you know, we have uh, CTS Promotions that does a pretty big toy show in Columbus, Ohio, tw- twice a year. And even when I'm going there, it's rare that I see Centurions. I, I, out of this entire toy show, and it's a good size show, uh, quite a few hundreds of tables, uh, you know, set up at the show. And I will only see maybe like one or two dealers that have like a Centurion item. That's about it. It's just something that I don't see all that common anymore, at, at, at all. Actually, I never did secondhand really see them all that often. Interesting. Why? Why do you guys think that might be so? I don't know. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't. You know, Centurions. We kind of dove on the price point earlier: ten dollars for a figure versus three dollars for a GI Joe figure. Uh, Transformers. Then again, I think they were about matched the same price with Transformers because weren't deluxe Transformers around nine ninety nine back in the day, or um, you know, like Prowl, we- Wheeljack, and all them. I think they were like around ten dollars. So you see them all very often, but Centurions, you just I don't know, man. I never understood why you never saw them anywhere. Well, I mean, maybe it's be- maybe it's because Transformers was more popular because it got to that high end market first and. Also, another thing we've discussed on this podcast which was that um, by 1986, the uh, market for um, for uh, t- action figures and the cartoons based on action figures was um, uh, very crowded. It was at a glut. And so, you know, Centurions had about uh, 20 competitors all uh, trying, vying to get uh, the uh, same demographic. So, um Maybe if it had come along a few years earlier or a few years later, it would have done better. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, kids just had uh, too many options uh, to uh, bother with Centurions despite its inherent coolness. Yeah, apparently. Even, I, uh, I mean, in my area, a lot of us toy collectors are, we, we are, well, we have a network going among, uh, among ourselves. We have a group that we're all part of. Uh, we have monthly meetings that we all go to that turn into miniature toy shows. So I know a lot of collectors in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And I've had quite a few collectors stop over at my house to drop merchandise off or something. Or I'm selling to them or they just come over to visit. And whenever they walk in my toy room, they look at the Centurions and a lot of the reactions are the same. They, they just got the surprised look on their face like, are those Centurions? And it's like, yeah. Oh really? Is like is that line complete? I'm like, yeah, that's everything that came out in that toy line, and they're just kind of like, I don't know, they're scratching their head and like puzzled, like, wow, I didn't realize that there were that many figures. Everybody just assumed it was just tiny little toy line that came out, and that's it. Most people don't even know what they look like in person until they see them. Yeah, it's interesting, and and again, um, it's I I don't want to uh, to be you know partial. I am. I, as I many times say, I am nowadays mainly focusing on Transformers uh, just because I think I'm, I'm a gimmick guy. So, you know, I, I uh, even though I don't like, you know, uh, roll around on the ground, uh, you know, on the floor and, and, you know, make funny sounds as I play with the toys, but I still so mainly appreciate the toy value of, you know, combining these toys or, you know, putting on different accessories on them and you know the more functions a toy has just like with the centurions the more creative you get to be the more it has an appeal to me so that's why for for example for uh, in this cacophony uh of you know uh, of 80s toys i'm surprised that it didn't do better maybe it's the price point like like you guys and even alton suggested uh because you know for example when you look at the visionaries it just it's just like a gi joe figure with a hologram you know, chest plate. If you could, if I, I respect, you know, Masters of Universe, but it basically it's just a, an action figure. When you look at GI Joe, and I love GI Joe, but and and I, you know, they they have a lot of accessories and a lot of vehicles, so you know that's that's a, a, a plus. But uh, some of these other toy lines, um, even when I I talk about Sky Commanders, which kind of was a spinoff of Centurions in a way, um, unoffic- unofficially. 
Uh, I just don't see that much play value with the other uh, toy lines. Uh, and still, unfortunately, Centurions didn't survive, you know, the 80s that much. Well, um, at least uh, Masters of the Universe, um, all the figures had the built-in action features. I don't know, man. Like, like punching and stuff? But, yeah, I mean, one of the things oh, sorry, I... I meant, like, what, what did it do? I was going to say, yeah, I mean, the thing I, I love about Centurions is the interchangeability, um, that basically you could become an amateur toy designer and create your own assault weapon systems, and um, as long as you had enough toys, you could build any weird combination you could imagine. Right, right, right. And even, you know, com like combine bad guys with, you know, some of the good guys accessories. Also, uh, although funnily, uh, even though, uh, you know, now we interact with a bunch of fans, I don't really recall any fans posting pictures of, of uh, putting Centurion's weapons on, on the bad guys, even though, you know, they have the pegs, they have the connecting points, you know, nobody really did that, I think. I did it. I mean, on the photos, like, you know, displaying yeah. it to Hooper. Well, I wish I'd taken photos of these things when I still had them. Yeah, but, well, you know, now that, now that you know, uh, uh, Mark, home invasion, Longo is uh, is back in action, in, I'm saying is it's just a matter of time. So, so you know, uh, but yeah, I, I, I totally uh, to feel you when you, you know, you had the opportunity to do something with you know in a certain place or with a certain thing and then the time passes you kind of get regretful of not doing it so okay uh let's 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 move on um uh so this was mainly the 90s um and just as a as a as a footnote nick uh so you said that you participated in these groups were they formed in the 90s these toys collecting you know, groups no, or no. or the they were there I'm, the one i'm in i'm in two of them and one of them was formed in I want to say 2005, 2006, and then there's another one that's a, that started about four four years ago, and uh, that one's a lot bigger. That the monthly meetings are basically miniature toy shows, which I, I should put on a side note because I kind of hinted to it, but I really stated it, and I don't want to confuse anyone listening. But me and Mark are only about like I don't. Know, like not even a 20 minute drive apart from each other we're uh we're both in the cleveland suburb area so me and mark have met up at these local you know uh toy swap meets quite a few times and seen each other up there so either you know what i mean about four years old i so four four years old for that group so it's more 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 of a modern thing that's for sure and that's all because of facebook definitely Helping people right. get more coordinated, you know, or uh, organized with each other. Right, 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 and uh, and so yeah, so apparently that that's a later phenomenon. Then, so let's not talk about you know the uh, the emergence of uh, of of eBay and you know online selling because that probably you know give a boost to a lot of these fandoms. Um, and so my experience personally was that, and I already you know told the story on the podcast, uh, was that in Roughly the mid 2000s, early 2000s, I was still in high school and I remembered, you know, Centurions and I remembered a lot of things that I revisited when, you know, we had finally received the option to connect to the internet either at school, you know, and then had internet installed at home as well. And then discovered these fan pages that you know us collectors already created because you guys had internet a few years earlier than we did so it was a great you know experience to discover you know uh and, and the store full story of toy lines and to basically patch your little fuzzy memories together with with info from other fans and that's when uh, i think I discovered eBay and through uh, a lady who was um, the wife of a, a U.S. Army soldier uh, who were stationed um, near my hometown because of the Balkans War. Uh, she was basically teaching as an English teacher in my high school. And through her, I got, I think, uh, Jake Rockwell Fire Force uh, figure. 
And I think I also got the yearbooks that they released kind of as a in conjunction with the comic books the and the cartoon line. All the British and, ones. Uh, yeah. Maybe, was it British? But were those yearbooks British? I, I yeah. Th- these are the the hardcover ones, right? I, uh, and they had like little bios yeah, of the characters. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah they, they are. I got those from Anthony Radcliffe. Yeah, I got one of them from him as well. I don't. Uh, were they hardcover? I thought they were just hardcover. Uh, they they were hardcover. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. And I definitely, you know, for for collectors who who are not on a huge budget, I think these are really fine additions to your collection because they have, like Mark said, they have bios, they have really nice art. So if you if you only want a few Centurions items, they're really great additions to your collection. And if you're, uh, you know, uh, a, a maximalist and you want everything, then you should also keep an eye out for these because I think these are still affordable additions to the uh you know to to any centurions uh collectors uh you know shelf because they haven't exploded in price as much as the actual figures so so yeah these were the only additions until this podcast comes out oh yeah and <laughs> until this podcast comes out exactly work and so yeah these were the only we're gonna drive the price up yeah um can we why don't we dive into that topic uh for a moment about the popularity of the toy line and the surgence of prices that we've been seeing. And, I, and why I, I want to kind of branch into that is because, uh, in my opinion, Centurions, the popularity of that toy line has really gone up. And y- y- it's pretty evident by looking at how much the secondary value of the toys have risen over the last couple of years. And when I started the Centurions group, Five, it was about five years ago. There were I remember playing on Facebook, and at that time I was in a number of GI Joe, number Transformers, mask groups already, and I'm and I looked for Centurions and I found nothing. And I was kind of really surprised by that, and I was like, "Wow, okay, there's no one has a Centurions group going on." Oh, all right. Well, um, I know a few collectors. Like I already knew Mark. Via Messenger, we talked quite a bit. I knew Anthony and a couple other people. So I'm like, well, I guess, you know what? Let's we'll start a group here. And uh, that's how the group literally started. And the first year, you would go, we would get months that went by without anyone requesting to join a group. It was just like, and I, I remember thinking to myself, wow, these insurance just really, there's not that many fans apparently for it. And now we go, uh, what, like in, in the one week time period, we get almost at least one or two requests a day for people wanting to join the group. Uh, and, and I always wondered, why is that? And then I started thinking about it. And in the last couple of years, you have various YouTube artists that have spotlighted Centurions or brought Centurions up. When Toy Galaxy a couple of years ago did their little bit on Centurions, Giving you the history and a rundown of the of of the show and the toy line. After that episode, that episode uploaded on YouTube, I noticed that we started getting a lot more. Uh, uh, the number of requests for the group increased because now people are now made aware of it, and they're like, "Oh wow, yeah, I remember Centurions. Okay, I wonder if there's a group for it or whatever." And you know, people go online and try to do a little research on their own for Centurions and. You know the group would show up in their search uh, in their search, so you know they send a request, and uh, a couple of times on the Mike Mercy channel on YouTube, he's brought up Centurions in a random conversation about his toy room tour or talking about eighties toys, and then all of a sudden, after he uploads that, we get a few more requests for people to join. And there, you know, a few other people, you know, uh, YouTube artists or online people who, you know, I mean, that have Facebook, large number of Facebook followers would post something about Centurions. And then the numbers for the group would start, you know, the request would, get, you know, go up. So for every time someone brings up Centurions, and I think they're just reminding people of our age that, hey, this was a toy line. And then people are just automatically remember it. Now they want to know more about it. 
and you have a lot new, a lot more larger number of toy collectors than you did about 10 years ago. So now, as you get more people interested in the Centurions, the, the prices are going up and up every day as, as more and more fans become more aware of the, the property itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I th- it, it, it might be, you know, the, uh, the internet and I'm, you know, we'll, we'll get to that point. I just wanted to kind of discuss the 2000s a bit, but, you know, I, it's fair what you say is that maybe because of COVID recently and people getting stuck at home and, you know, people, uh, you know, having the, not having the discipline to, to, to restrain their impulses and so they splurge online and buy a bunch of stuff and including centurions figures maybe revisiting some old memories that usually when they're working they didn't have the time to and that's why maybe centurions also uh, you know was surging but you know just to just to to go back i think uh when um so when at the time when i bought my my jake rockwell and those two hardcover books uh i think prices were way more affordable and it was interesting to see this rise from like, you know, I would say early, mid 2000s up until now, which was shockingly enough, uh, 15, um, 10, 15 years ago, how, how, you know, basically from even getting a full, you know, detonator under a hundred dollars, uh, or getting like a Jake, I, I don't know. I think I should track down that email when I won the Jake Rockwell auction, but I think it was, it was probably 10, $15 or, or maybe $20 at best. And now, you know, uh, there are extreme examples when, for example, just a single, single radar for swing shot, uh, costs more than one or two weapon systems, in the in the 2000s so so you know yes as like like you said the, as as shows became you know um a good funnel to draw people back into the fandom make people discover the toy lines uh that's what probably caused the surge but you know there are some ridiculous prices out there so for example you know just just out of you know just to be be uh transparent and i don't th- think that uh, that's a bad thing because this is how we help each other in the fandom and uh, you know times that are already passed i can say that like when i got my swing shot and my seabed i think the prices were around like 200 and 250 so for, for around 450 dollars i think i got both of them and uh and now i now i think they, they probably are around three, four, five hundred dollars and this is just going to increase to the point where just like I said before the radar piece the actually the only piece I missed from my swing shot costs or recently was posted for 150 dollars so um, what's what's your take guys on on this 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 crazy surge of prices ten years ago um, let's say ten years ago I remember you can get the, the, the three basic figures with the weapon systems, like Ace McCloud with Sky Knight for, I think, 30, 40 bucks is what they were going for uh, at toy shows and at toy shops. And now you're paying, on average, at a toy show around $80 to get a complete, like Ace McCloud or uh, Max Ray or Jake, uh, Jake Rockwell. It's around 80 or something like that, plus or minus, depending on the condition and the wear on the on the parts, obviously, but oh yeah, the prices have doubled on that easily. Yeah, and um, with uh, in the case of Seabat, Slingshot, and Traumatizer, um, yeah, once the collectors realized that these are the rare items, they started uh, charging the moon for them. Uh, unfortunately, even Strafers. Uh, w- a couple years ago. On average, at a toy show, a really good deal, and you can find it, was $30 for a strafer, complete. Now, you're not finding a strafer for no $30 complete at a toy show. You're paying about 50 bucks easily. And then when you go on eBay, they're easily 50 or more for a strafer complete. So the prices on all of it has really gone up, but especially on the uh, holy grail of the three of the line. Wow, man. Those, they, they The price is almost close to doubled on those on average now. It's insane, right? So uh, I have a I have a uh, guess here. We've previously talked about probably one of the memes of recent 
uh, you know, Centurions uh, collectors or, you know, one of the recent memes for Centurions collectors was basically that poor little head that's been floating around on eBay for $2,000 for a prototype Rex. Um, and it's just a head for, again, for $2,000. And apparently, you know, we were laughing about it and saying that this is ridiculous and who on earth would buy that? Apparently nobody did so far, even though I think it, it started at 2,500 and then went down to 2,000, uh, you know, dollars. And uh, maybe the other toys prices will, you know, soon uh, match that or, you know, or, or get to that level. Uh, because because things are getting so expensive. What surprises me, like Doc Terror, them little claws that he came with, the black claws, uh, those are, you've seen just a pair of those claws go for like $50, just for the black part of the, you know what I mean, the, the black claws themselves. 50 bucks I've seen them go for. I was like, That's crazy. Wow. That's crazy. I remember when I bought my Doc Terror in the store, he had only one claw, so... um. I don't, I don't know what was going on at Kenner, or maybe someone broke into this particular toy and took one of the claws, but uh, I wonder if there's some sort of manufacturing problem uh, with that particular accessory. Yeah, although I would say that there, are, there, there have been um, collectors who 3D printed um, a decent-looking claw, and, and so maybe as prices go up, that might you know, shape ways parts even might become options to complete your collections, you know, missing small, um, small pieces. Yeah, that's the nice thing about Centurions is that there's not that many reproduction parts about that. Uh, so, uh, and when I say nice part about that is if you're new to the collection, it's very obvious to look at a 3D part and know it's 3D printed. There's not that many people making reproduction parts at all. So you don't have to worry about getting swindled and buying something and paying top dollar for it only to find out that the parts are uh, the reproductions. So, I mean, because Star Wars, Transformers, and G.I. Joe, yeah, that's a common issue. You know, you got reproduction parts that are in that, uh, are everywhere for that toy line. So Centurion's the, the popularity for them to have reproduction parts yet is not quite up there yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not really concerned about, you know, reproduction parts. Uh, I would actually be happy if there would be more. But then again, I understand that it could fool the uh, novice collector into thinking uh, that it's it's a legit part. So, so yeah. I think it's great that they exist as long as you charge a fair price for them and don't try to pass them off as the originals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it's 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 an interesting uh, phenomenon. What uh, you know, what the need for toys generates because there's not enough out there. Uh, interestingly, you know, a few years ago, apparently it was really affordable to collect Centurions toys because you know one of our uh, group members on Facebook, who uh, goes by the pseudonym of Max Ray. Uh, for obvious reasons, um, he has a vast collection of, of uh, you know, identical figures, multiple weapon systems, and they just, you know, on his photos, they just stand in a row as if, you know, they were, you know, stormtroopers or, you know, army builder collections, uh, which is funny. And he, uh, he said that he collected them several years ago when prices were still affordable. So, um, you know, wh whether, you know, some, some group members uh, applaud that, some, of course, probably who don't have access to these figures uh, are maybe more critical of this. But, you know, objectively speaking, I think, you know, it was probably a shrewd and, uh, you know, smart idea to, to get these figures not, you know, one day, but you know get get them you know sooner because now you know they are double triple price it's i think collecting uh, a full set like the one nick has might become more and more difficult especially like boxed would be you know crazy like you know if, even maybe i think i we, we recently saw a boxed swing shot for like 800 or a thousand dollars or something <sighs> but it's yeah um 
prices definitely have gone up on it, and the, the getting them, the boxes too are becoming to be more scarce. And and I think I made that comment earlier that you know Kenner didn't use the greatest quality cardboard. I'm not saying it was horrible quality, but yeah, you know, it's it wasn't the most robust cardboard. And uh, the boxes just didn't survive over the years as much as you would think. I mean, you, you would have easier odds finding Transformer or G.I. Joe boxes than you would for uh, Centurions. That's for sure. Right. And then again, the boxes weren't necessarily meant for, uh, for, you know, for survival because they were like, oh, you know, it should look nice when we print, you know, in the glossy when we print the uh, art on it. But otherwise, they would be ripped apart and disposed of by parents uh, or kids even. So, so you know, the, the goal wasn't to make the sturdiest of boxes. No. Yeah, I doubt any of the toy companies of that era were thinking, um, well, um, is this package going to survive uh, in 30 or 40 years? Um, by the way, speaking of boxes, you know what I've seen on, on sale occasionally for high prices? The cardboard shipping boxes that uh, the toys were sent to stores in. It's just a cardboard box that says, like, Centurion's Tidal Blast and... and um, you know, has some other technical stuff on it, and people are, are charging for that. And it's an empty box, yeah, no actual cool. toys inside. That amazes me that those even survived over all these years. Uh, yeah, like, who would do that? Or, like, you know, it was, a, like, a crazy one of these, like, with all due respect, you know, like, living in their parents' basement, kind of <laughs> weirdo, like, a golem-type guy who's, like, Ah, well, I'm gonna collect all these boxes ah. for you know, like, uh, like what, what do you call them? Uh, uh, um, what's what's that mental uh, thing? Uh, obsessive consult, compulsive collecting, or something like that? Obsessive or, compulsive or obsessive disorder. Oh, I think you'd be surprised, man. I, I worked retail in the '90s at uh, Kmart, and I still would just if I needed the box, I would grab something from work. So uh, when I moved. You'd be surprised at how many Power of the Force shipping cases I had, or Batman the animated series uh, figure assortment bo- cases I had. And then what you know, I, I just grabbed boxes at work. I worked in the toy department, so I just grabbed whatever I had. And uh, nice. I, I used to have a lot of those shipping boxes. And then when I realized that collectors were after them, or I should say, when other collectors realized that I had them, you know, you want to trade, you want to sell, and it's like. Do you really want that? I'm like, all right, just give me another cardboard box. I can put that stuff in there and have some, you know, somewhere to store this crap. So you could have it. I would just give them away. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't care for them all that much. It wasn't a big deal for me. Yeah, it's 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 strange how like you know what fandom means for some people and what it means for some other people. You know, like um, for me, you know, I I do not buy secondhand toys for some reason you know of course centurions is a is a different case but to me you know it it if 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 there is especially because i collect new toys mostly nowadays um it's easy to get you know boxed uh pieces but you know i would i if i could i would buy mint centurions toys and then open open them up just so I get that experience of opening them up. But I know that therefore it would cause like a huge drop in value. Of course, I don't plan on selling it, but, but still, you know, it's, I'm not, I'm not really the kind of guy who like wants to buy, you know, toys with other people's dirt and gunk and, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, like snot on them when they were kids and they played with it in the sand. But then again, you know, uh, that's me. Some people don't mind even buying, you know, loose, uh, incomplete pieces or just buying uh, an, a weapon system and, and putting it together by, by you know, buying the pieces on eBay. But apparently for some people, even the boxes, like when, when we made fun of this kind of or like laughed about this on, on the group, some people came up with like valid uh, or not valid comments, but like subjective comments saying, no, like this is value for some collectors. I find it interesting how you make that, how you were saying you would better if you could get a mint centurion and box and open it up. For me, I, I can't do that. And, I, you know, not to go off topic, but I'm just going to throw it out there really quick. I did that with Batman, the animated series. It is easier to buy them figures on card than it is to find them loose because, you know, it's a toy line that kids played with. And, uh, it was cheaper. So I got all, you know, I got Batman, Robin on card. I got all the villains on card, and that's all I wanted. 
And my plan was to open them up and, you know, put them, put them on one of my shelves. And then I kind of stopped. I couldn't do it. I'm like, this toy has survived over 25 years on the card. I can't do it. I can't bear myself to rip these things out of there. So I have them in my collection, and they're, I, I, I have them on the peg hooks now in the, in the one corner of my toy room. I just I couldn't do it. I couldn't open them. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Mark, what's your stance on boxed or opened or, or on, you know, what? on different types of collecting habits? Well, um, I mean, of course, the better condition the toy is in, the more I would prefer it. But on the other hand, uh, you know, I never have a lot of money these days. And it's actually been a while since I bought a collector's toy as, a, as opposed to a new one. And, um, you know, when I buy these toys, I almost always open them anyway. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't... Uh, you know, keep them uh, closed it, with the intention of selling them later. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if I can find one mint, that would be great. But if I can't, you know, as long as it's complete and in good condition, I'll take it. I'm just grateful Mark took care of his toys and uh, his Centurion. So now that I look at them, they're in good shape. So, Mark, I always appreciate Whoa. that you did that. Well, oh, what well, a monster you. rubbing it. <laughs> Mark has been teasing me about that for quite some years, some time now, and some for some years. So, but, well, you uh, know, even I, I, I mean, to be honest, though, even with the Cherions, there, I, 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 like I said, some of them might be marked or not. We don't know. Uh, one of these days, Mark's gonna have to come over and try to ID these and be like, "Yep, I remember. I put that scratch on there, right there." You know, we'll have to have to do that one day. But the dump, they were not really designed to survive well over all these years because the friction tabs just. It doesn't take much to wear them out. That is for sure. For the, uh, for the missiles for, and all for, that. For the Centurions? Like, yeah. which fr friction tabs do you mean? All, it, just the tabs insert, the, like, you know, the missiles onto the figures or the weapon system, the tabs themselves. It doesn't take right. much to wear out those tabs. So, that, if I'm wording it correctly, I, I you know, I call it a friction tab. You know, they just lock in with friction. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't take much to wear those things out. There's a lot of mine that I had to use a thin piece of paper and you know, kind of like wrap it around the tab to sicken up the tab to lock it. You know, they have it stay onto the figure. Yeah, I always have problems with them. Like I would try to put uh, the plasma missile uh, from Fire Force back in the launcher, and it it wouldn't stay. It would keep uh, you know going off prematurely. Yeah, I got. I think I have a rubber band, or uh, I did a rubber band that worked for a while. But then I ended up taping some Teflon, taking Teflon tape and wrapping it around the. Uh, piece of the missile and then put it back in the launcher and, that, and that's keeping it in there now well see i i never had the uh the mentality to come up with those kind of ideas or the uh dexterity to actually do them by the way uh, on the swing shot i had i could never make the uh big mega blasters stay attached to anything on the slingshot really i'm trying to think here you talking about the one on the chest or no no those are the 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 big things are supposed to attach to Jake's arms with the uh, the two barrels. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, mine, surprisingly, that stays pretty well secured on his arms. I don't have any problems with that one falling huh. off. So, all I do know is with Seabat, though, man, I, I made the newbie mistake with that one. And as soon as I got that, I tried to display it, and I broke two hoses right off the bat. And uh, I was oh, able wow. to get replacements, luckily. But that for any new collector that gets a sea bat, take a hot, take a hair dryer and or a hot cup of water and soften up them hoses before even attempting to put them on there on on Max because they will break very easily. The plastic is not aged well on that one at all. So yeah, that's that's today's takeaway right from Nick's mouth. You know, warm up those hoses before you do anything with them. So uh, <laughs> FYI. Uh, by the way, um. If any toy company ever brings Centurions back, I hope that they will listen to this uh, podcast and uh, make the toys and the packaging uh, to last. I'm curious to know if toy designers have that in mind now. Like with the modern Earthrise Transformers, do the people, the designers at Hasbro, have it in their head that maybe we should make this package be able to last for a good 30 years? You know what I mean? I wonder if that crosses their mind at all or it's just make the cheapest you know, disposable package as possible to keep the toy from, you know what I mean, getting to the kids' hands. And let's not worry well, about that. 
honestly speaking, just to hijack the show for a second, just because it's, I guess, kind of relevant. Um, when it comes to Transformers, they have, you know, multiple packagings. So basically, when it comes to the uh, mail order, I don't know whether this had an equivalent in the 80s or the 90s, but the ones that are more collector oriented, so you have to go on the website or to online retailers to get them. These are called the Generation Selects. Nick, you're probably familiar um, with them. A little, yeah. They, they are shipped in just like, you know, uh, cardboard boxes that don't have really a window on them. They're just like, you know, almost like generic shipping boxes with the Transformers logo on it. You open it up and the only you have, you know, only the uh, that, you know, bubble inside or I don't know what that that frame inside that, the you know, trans transparent plastic frame, which has the figure attached to it and the uh, documentation. So those boxes, while they're not as as um, you know, as uh, displayable or not as visible, they are far more sturdy. As I'm, you know, looking at it at those boxes right now in my room. Uh, so, so basically, they they will survive. But the question is, uh, are they valuable enough to keep around? Because they are all, again, they are like parcel type, you know, shipping boxes. Uh, when it comes to the ones that have windows, the ones that are sold in retail, I would say that um, I don't necessarily know if they are. Um, meant to be um or, or they were designed to be i haven't seen a, a centurion's box or in you know in person or in, i haven't had it in my hand but i would say that there's probably not a not a real reason to make them super sturdy you know uh, by by hasbro or takara but i would say that um you know uh just the just just because they probably are you know taking uh you know you know professional collectors or serious collectors in mind, they might have, you know, kept that in mind when designing these boxes so that they would even in the box, you know, retain some of their, uh, or stay durable for multiple years. But, uh, I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily for toy, for, for toy, uh, uh, companies. That's, that's necessarily a priority or anything. Yeah. That, I mean, when I you look back, because I still have some original uh, Transformer boxes, and I'm looking at, like the box where like Wheeljack and uh, for its time, it was pretty it was pretty durable. The cardboard was decent quality. The plastic or the paper insert was the plastic bubble. It was all pretty decent quality back then. But uh, then you get other stuff like you know Centurions. They had an inner cardboard sleeve to them, where it was kind of like two boxes in one. You have to pull out a you know what I mean? A separate box underneath that housed everything kind of zip-tied or taped to it. So they were pretty decently qu uh, sturdy quality, but not a lot of people kept those inserts, and they kind of quickly went to the garbage, but they kept the box. So that's why you don't yeah. find a lot of the boxes in decent condition anymore. Yeah, I didn't keep them. Maybe I should have. So, yeah, but without that inner box, you know what I mean? The stability of the outer box becomes a lot more fragile. So that's why you definitely don't see them as in good shape anymore. Yeah, I wonder if you, if, if someone would take the time to recreate, to scan them and recreate some, you know, repro boxes. I don't know if that's a thing for other toy lines. Um, but all I can say is that uh, I, I, I recently, in the past few years, now that I moved to... Uh, to America and started working, you know, and and had the the funds to to afford myself to be a collector. Uh, now was the time when I went through all the you know all the the first time experiences that a toy collector faces. And first, I lived um, in Connecticut. Then I moved to to Brooklyn, New York, and then I moved to to Queens, New York. And uh, you know, I first faced moving with boxes that I didn't want to fold. I didn't want to throw out pieces uh, of these boxes, you know, the, the, that, you know, the plastic bubble. And then, you know, life basically forced me, even even though I, I'm not living with a family, you know, just by myself, uh, I, I still felt the need to, you know, to, to you know, to, to kind of uh, streamline my collection. So I, I, for the special packages, because for example, for, for the Ghostbusters Transformers collaboration that came out last year, the transformable Ecto uh, vehicle, they did in a vintage, you know, old 80s style uh, Transformers box for that. Um, you know, I, I would keep those, but, but for the retail ones, I would flatten them, maybe cut out the uh, art 
and then dispose of the rest because there's just not enough space. So like Mark said, you know, like, like, like you didn't really keep in mind, there's also the issue of space. Like I have multiple, like there are multiple cardboard boxes, like moving boxes still in my room that just, you know, store folded up transformers boxes. And I will have to, you know, get rid of some of those because it's just takes up space. So, so I don't, I, I don't blame people who didn't keep these boxes, but then again, you would have to have a dedicated room and a lot of space to actually get these box figures and display them because they are just, you know, they're not necessarily uh, reasonable, you know, to, to keep around. I'm the same way. Modern Transformers, they go right in the garbage. I don't even keep the boxes for them anymore. Uh, I, I just don't have the room. Unless it's a high-end collector's item like the uh, Bandai Soldier Golden Voltrons. Okay, that's a different story. I kept the boxes for all those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, guys, uh, just to kind of... Um, you know, uh, finish up this episode because we're around one hour. How about uh, we give a couple of useful tips when it comes to collecting and getting centurions, both for uh, you know experienced collectors and uh, and you know beginners, so to say, as well. What would you um, suggest? You know, in a nutshell, people do and people don't do. Me, personally, I'm going to suggest if it's not complete, don't buy it. Uh, the reason I say that is because if you're going to buy, say, a detonator and it's missing a bunch of pieces, the two most common pieces missing in the detonator are going to be those orange, yellowish caps that go on the top of the gun barrel. Those right there are by far the most expensive part of about that entire playset. By the time you buy two of those, you pretty much paid half the value of the detonator itself. Just buy complete, if possible. If it's a rare item that you don't see all that often and it's and you, you can get it cheap, obviously a different story or even a common item. If it's dirt cheap and incomplete, go ahead. You can always you can get the parts pieces together maybe quite easily, but if you're on the budget and you're trying to spend the least amount of money possible, I would always suggest buy complete or don't even bother because you're going to put more money into it completing it in the long run. That, 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 that's fair. Would you also say that if someone you know only has uh, the budget to buy incomplete toys and as maybe you know thinking of printing you know you know 3D printing accessories or, or just you know maybe uh, you know keeping them until they get something better? It depends on the person. Uh, if having an incomplete toy does not bother you, then what I said really doesn't apply. Uh, you know, and I should have stated that that a lot of collectors I know are completist, where it, it, they want they have an, it has to be complete. If it's not complete, it's going to drive them nuts until they complete it. And I'll admit it, that's how I am. I want my toys to be uh, pretty much all anything I buy to be complete. So. If you're if you're not a completist and that doesn't bother you, then buy it cheap. You know you can always get a 3D printed part if someone does make it and get it at an affordable price. You know why not? I bought a traumatizer uh, really cheap because it was missing the missile. Uh, you know in its abdomen, and we have a uh, we have a member in the Centurions group that makes 3D printed missiles, and he actually does a really good job at those too. And I just bought one of his, and I'm happy. It's my second traumatizer, so it didn't bother me that it was not incomplete. But you know, if you can get a traumatizer for you know for a hundred dollars, missing just missing the missile, well, you'd be a fool to pass that one up. So, yeah. And now, since you mentioned the second traumatizers that you have, I might uh, join in on Mark's uh, you know nocturnal activities. Uh, AKA their his home invasion plans, but uh, well, as long as we can swing by Mark's place afterwards and get his uh, you know Rex charger, you know I'm I'm okay with that. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll just pull an Italian Italian job and be like, hey Nick, let's raid Mark's place. Hey Mark, let's raid Nick's place, and then you guys end up like, hey, raiding each other's places with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Mark, do you have any uh, suggestions regarding uh, you know Centurions collecting? 
Well, I got to admit, I don't do a lot of collecting of anything these days, uh, so I'm not the expert, but I would say probably, uh, you know, just uh, make sure that the uh, the buyer or seller you're dealing with has a good reputation. Uh, you know, if you're uh, buying off eBay, uh, see what their rating is. If you're buying off, like, uh, Facebook or some other website, uh Maybe ask around about that person, uh, see what other people say about them. Uh, and uh, you also, um, maybe you should either buy a 3D printer or, or get to be friends with someone who has one. Because it looks like those things are going to be uh, you know, very useful for making reproduction parts uh, in the years ahead. You know, Just be ethical in the way you do it. Uh, don't pass them off as originals. Don't charge exorbitant prices for them. Well, Mark mentioned eBay, and if you're anyone new in the collecting, I would strongly suggest Facebook toy groups. It's, you know, to look for items uh, at, a, at at a more affordable price. You're gonna find it on in the toy groups at a much better deal than you're gonna find it on eBay any day. Uh, but I would focus first primarily on the toy groups, any toy shows in your area possible, and don't underestimate garage sales. I mean, you can get lucky. I know a lot of Star Wars collectors and G.I. Joe collectors that are still finding amazing, you know, hauls at a uh, garage sale. So, but eBay really, I, I you know, I, I don't, you know, not to sound rude towards eBay, but at the rate the prices are and all that stuff, because you got to keep in mind, as a seller, you're going twenty to thirty percent over the uh, what it should sell for, just so you can make you know make a profit off of it. So you go in the toy show uh, in toy groups, you're generally going to get like twenty percent cheaper rates than you would be on eBay. So that that's my uh, another suggestion I like to throw out there. You know? Right, and if you uh, if you trade on um, on Facebook, I would add that. You know, I, I'm usually casual about this, but I've only purchased actually one um, or, or I, I once on, on eBay or maybe twice. And both and one was, you know, I met with a guy in, uh, in person and the other one was um, he, you know, posted the thing to me. And basically, you know, there's if you in these situations, you use PayPal and with PayPal, you know, you have two options. One is that you do it as a purchase, as merchandise, and the other one is you use the friends and family option. The difference between these two is that with friends and family, there's no charge for the transaction. So basically, if you send someone $5, then they will receive $5. The caveat is that uh, you cannot, uh, if the person doesn't uh, send you the toy, you cannot really um, tell PayPal to get that money back because it was just sent as a gift, you know, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a private gift. However, if you opt to choose the uh, merchandise or the, 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 the sale um, option, I don't know what's it actually called, uh, but then it's, you... It, it's, uh, uh, they call it just merchant, per, you know, sending it as a merchant purchase, whatever. As a merchant purchase, thank you. Then, then basically you have the chance to, you know, uh, report the person if the items are not sold. Now, the only reason this matters uh, for the person selling is that, you know, if, if, if they're like, okay, $10, $10 then uh, if they want the exactly $10, they would have to request an extra, I don't know how much from you, a few cents from you, uh, you know, depending on the price 4%. of the complete item, 4%, thank you, uh, to, to, uh, to send it as, as, a, as a merchant. Uh, however, you know, they might say that they don't want to charge you because they would, they would pass that expense usually on to you as a buyer. So, you know, if, if, they, if they say you can, you know, if you, if you want to pay 4% less, then do a friends and family purchase. Now, my suggestion here, and I, I, I guess maybe the guys, uh, you know, agree with this, is that if you do so, do it to your own risk. If you know the guy, if you trust the guy, if if maybe a Facebook group has a, uh, like uh, I know that there's a Hungarian Transformers group that has an Excel sheet online that can be viewed and can be updated with 
how many successful sales a person completed. So if the person is dependable, you can go with the friends and family option at your own risk. But if it's an unknown person and you don't really want to risk it, then you know figure out whether you want to play the pay the four percent or if the guy means the price as if you know a, a, in this in the sense that it includes the four percent. So then he would get less than you know the posted price so that's something to keep in mind because we with ebay you know they're pretty decent with uh you know punishing uh you know sellers uh with aliexpress you know the uh, alibaba uh website that deals with a lot of chinese items and they operate from china they are also really good at this but when it comes to you know kind of uh casual environments like facebook it 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 is you know it is a hit or miss whether you find a good seller or not and that's an excellent point to, that you brought up, uh, and that's my my general rule is, and I actually I when I when I when we first started the uh, Facebook group, and we discuss and uh, the rules that went in forth was, you know, anyone selling you're not to ask for friends and family, and mainly because the buyer has zero protection against that. So factor in, you know, I, 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 it's part of rules. Factor in your fees when you ask for a price on the item. I, you know, I would never buy anything unless I know this person really well or have done repeated transactions with them, where I would send it to them as a gift. And even at that point, I've been burned by people that I consider to be trustworthy, and you don't know what's going on in this person's life where they just all of a sudden you're like snap and start pulling shady stuff off so i always yeah. send it as a merchant and also you could print the shipping label through paypal at, you know as a merchant payment a lot easier than friends and family you know because nice. paypal will let you do first class mailing while the postal service online site won't let you do that if you yeah. want to be and, pre and you know you hear about these nightmare stories about some people uh you know who for example you know um uh, say that you know you know on the buyer side you know say that oh i'm going to give you 150 dollars for a rex charger prototype and then they give you a uh, hundred dollars and disappear for many many years and you, know, you have to be careful with those all i'm saying is what what's what's next for them they do a home invasion yeah yeah you, you gotta watch them sketchy people matt they, you know they're out there <clears throat> yeah you never know what you yeah. can trust these days by the way um uh I know we're getting near the end, but I'd like to suggest uh, maybe a topic for another time, which is collecting non-toy centurions merchandise. I mean, for a franchise that was around for such a short time, um, you know, a lot of people were convinced that centurions was going to be the next big toy hit. So um, uh, there were a, a lot of uh, non-toy items made, everything from, uh, you know, coloring books to lunch boxes to sleeping bags to uh, toy banks. So, um yeah, maybe we could talk about the ins and outs of collecting those items. Yeah, that's actually a good point. So, yeah, why don't we uh, we wrap up this episode? And it was great to have you guys on the show. And um, power, power extreme. extreme.